<clears throat> Ladies and uh, gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Mika Autola, and I would like to, uh, as a director of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, I would like to welcome you very warmly to our new uh, event format, uh, FIA Forum. The Finnish uh, Institute of International Affairs is launching this uh, new flagship event, annual flagship event, FIA Forum, uh, to highlight FIA's strategic research priorities that cut across different programs, projects, and networks of FIA. For the next few years, this uh, priorities will focus on geoeconomics and uh, Finnish foreign policy. The idea is to highlight uh, our priorities as well as our recent achievements when it comes to research. But the idea is not to reduce the importance of our more traditional, more programmatic uh, research areas that focus on uh, Russia, European Union, and global uh, level developments. But to catalyze and enhance what is already being done. The new annual event cannot be arranged in all of its uh, planned aspects this year. We had bigger plans for, for the events. Uh, and we are very grateful that despite of the pandemic, we have managed to pull together a physical event, a hybrid event, where there's quite a lot of participants viewing this uh, from different corners geographically, and we have also a good audience here. Uh, uh, and this is the first time we have had an audience for a little while. And unfortunately, it looks like uh, we are not going to have these hybrid events uh, for a couple of uh, months, at least. The situation is getting uh, worse. So we are trying to uh, do our best to wear masks and practice proper physical uh, distancing measures. Ladies and gentlemen, let's focus on the theme of the event today, one of our strategic priorities, uh, geoeconomics. The age of geoeconomics the deployment of uh, econo economy and technology for geopolitical purposes is upon us. Recently, despite uh, the brief truce in the US-China trade wars, uh, Washington appears to have no intention in holding of its efforts to eliminate uh, China's uh, technological competencies and especially uh, Huawei Corporation's 5G telecommunication networks. In fact, the contestation of the technologies is a part of a wider struggle between the two countries for hegemony in certain strategic technologies, including 5G semiconductors, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. This game is not a win-win game. It is a zero-sum game. Competition is likely to gain in intensity going forward. Infrastructure investments in the new technologies and the technological domains will expand great powers' respective spheres of influence through connectivity and dependency that connectivity creates. At the same time, reserve currencies will produce network effects and sustain financial controlling powers. The international payment system allows the US to impose sanctions with immediate effect. And recently, it has perhaps even overused this power that it has in dollar economy. European Union has plans to do or implement similar type of sanctions in the future, as well as avoid the US uh, restrictions and sanctions that uh, curtail, for example, the trade with Iran, countries like Iran that are under heavy sanctions. 
The FIA Forum will discuss these geoeconomic developments. How does geoeconomics manifest itself in the strate uh, strategies and relations between actors such as China, European Union, Russia, and United States? What are the consequences for uh, the future of this, these new uh, games and developments? How the businesses and other actors should adapt and mitigate this new order? What is the future of international trade regime and financial system? And can the chair economic chain reaction somehow be manageable through perhaps new types of, of, uh, of multilateral tools? Dear audience, we are very pleased to have a high level uh, panel of speakers today with us. I will first introduce FIA's program director, Mikhail Vikel, who, has, who was in the original FIA team of researchers interested in chair economic issues and dynamics that started its motivating and motivated research activities about 10 years ago. Dr. Vikel is program director of the Global Security Research Program at FIA. He is uh, as well a chunk professor at Tampere University. He has held uh, visiting fellowships at Oxford University and a university in Buenos Aires, as well as a postdoctoral fellowship at the Academy of Finland. He has earned his uh, PhD from the London School of Economics and his former president of the Finnish International Studies Association, and he is one of the key people in this priority focus area, geoeconomics, that we, we are now uh, developing uh, more fully. So, uh, Mikael Vikel, uh, the floor is now yours. Well, thanks, Mika. <clears throat> I hope you can all, all hear me loud and clear. Um, yeah, this event, of course, gives me a lot of uh, personal pleasure, um, since it's certainly about the topic that I have been working on for, for many years already, at least for the last eight or nine or ten years or so. Um, back then, about ten years ago, um, when we, when we kick-started our geoeconomics uh, research at FIA, it was really not it was really not a topic that was much, much in vogue um, at the time. Uh, very few people actually knew the term geoeconomics as such, uh, or had heard about it. And um, it's been, of course, quite exciting to, um, as an institute as an, and, and as a researcher, to, to be part of this, of this rise, if, if one can say so. Uh, these days, there's, there's a lot of talk about geoeconomics these days, uh, both, as, both as a strategic practice, so something that uh, great powers or states in general uh, practice um, as a form of power politics, um, but also, also um, as an analytical framework that researchers use to make sense of, of international politics. Um, and FIA has certainly uh, been one of the, the um, pioneers, I dare to say, um, in, uh, in developing geoeconomics as an analytical framework, uh, something that we're, um, we're quite proud of. Um, now, during these years, um, I've usually been invited by, by economists uh, to talk about uh, geoeconomics uh, to economists. And, and those occasions are, of course, a bit like farting in church, because what I have to say, the message I have to say, is really that, that uh, the economy is far too important to be left only to economists alone. Um, the, the economy is, is really a, a strategic weapon, almost. Um, so um, that's why I define geoeconomics as, as the geostrategic use of, of economic power. So it's about using the economy um, and economic means for power political ends. Um, and this sort of geoeconomic power politics um, is very much on the rise because um, geoeconomics thrives in this world of interconnectivity, of hyperconnectivity and interdependence like our own. 
Um, so in today's world, uh, power and security um, are no longer simply coupled to the physical control of, of territory, the military control of territory um, by military means, but also very much to uh, commanding and kind of manipulating the economic, these economic connectivities and interdependencies that make up today's uh, globalized and, and interconnected world. And this is a very different world from the old Cold War world, um, where when two camps stood almost completely isolated uh, from each other, um, and where power was very much still based on militarily controlling territory. Um, so instead, ours is, is indeed a world of, of these deep interconnectivities um, and interdependencies in which power uh, very much resides in commanding and controlling these interconnectivities. So states that command these interconnectivities and control them uh, gain leverage over others um, who do not. So if your economy is dependent on me delivering your energy, I've got leverage over you, I can influence you with that. Right? So in today's world, um, traditional territory-based geopolitics is no longer the only game in town. Um, um, which also means that if, if we are about to, 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 to have a new Cold War, like some observers seem to think, um, it will look very different from the old one, uh, because it will be much more about geoeconomics uh, than traditional geopolitics. Unfortunately, geoeconomics um, as a form of power politics, I, I think it's still not very well understood. Um, perhaps because we still tend to look at uh, international politics either through these old um, traditional geopolitical lenses which tend to overestimate the effectiveness of military power or then we look at it through the, the kind of a bit more liberal idealistic perspective of the 1990s which failed a bit to see how these inter interdependencies could be used uh, to wield power and influence um, even in sometimes in an aggressive way. So what I want to do now is, is really to quickly just quickly highlight four different forms of geoeconomics or geoeconomic strategies. So let's start from the most obvious form of geoeconomics, which is, which is economic coercion. Um, some would call it economic warfare. Uh, so different forms of economic sanctions um, and other economic sticks uh, this is, of course, a form of geoeconomics that President Trump has put a lot of effort in, into, and it comes in various forms. Trade sanctions, financial sanctions, currency warfare, uh, embargoes, seizures, um, and the like. Lately, we've seen a lot of smart, so-called smart sanctions and secondary sanctions, uh, and especially the invention of secondary sanctions perhaps has been a kind of a, a new, um, new invention in, in the toolbox. So by wielding this economic stick, um, a state or a coalition of state tries to enforce another state, a target state, to submit and change its behavior. And, and, and the more dependent this state, the target state is on the global, these global economic flows and interconnectivities, the more vulnerable it will be um, to sanctions and other economic coercion. And economic coercion uh, has, of course, been, been used under many circumstances. Uh, it apparently played a big role under uh, in, in getting Iran um, to drop its nuclear arms program under Obama. Um, and even in the war against terrorism, it has been uh, playing a big role in cutting the finance of, of terrorism. And now sanctions have also uh, become perhaps the, one of the main tools, at least, by which the US and, and Europe also, to some extent, tries to contain a whole lot of, of, of state actors, including China and Russia. But mind you, economic coercion uh, is really only the most illustrious form of, of geoeconomics. There are other forms of geoeconomics that are much more subtle, uh, smarter many times, uh, and I will come to those. I'll just here want to say quickly that a big problem with economic coercion and sanctions in general is that the more you use it, the less effective it will become. Mika was alluding to this, this aspect as well, because country will start to hedge against you, against becoming a target of economic sanctions and coercion. So they will start to decouple their economies from you, from the coercer. And this is, of course, exactly what we've been seeing now recently, um, and which very much has accelerated with the COVID-19 crisis. 
um, countries becoming very mindful of their dependencies on others and their vulnerabilities to economic coercion. Now, a smarter geoeconomic strategy, in my mind at least, is what I call geoeconomic binding, um, which is a more subtle strategy. So here the idea is to use economic carrots uh, instead of sticks to bind um, other countries to oneself, making them economically dependent on, 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 on oneself, and through that gain political leverage over them. The EU enlargement uh, is actually a pretty good example of this, I think. Uh, what the EU did was in large measure to to provide its neighboring countries with economic carrots, making them bind themselves to uh, the EU. And through that, the EU also accomplished a lot of its political goals. And so the EU has not militarily enforced anybody to join this, uh, to join, join them, but, it, but the, it has economically attracted and persuaded other countries to join this new sort of regional empire, what we could even call it, right? And, and, and through that gain, it's a lot of political goals. Often it's forgotten how important this sort of economic binding also was for the US uh, during the Cold War um, con in containing the Soviet Union, uh, starting really from the Marshall Plan um, and the, the massive economic aid that the US gave to Europe um, following the Second War, World War, whereby it kind of ensured that certain countries would not glide into the Soviet sphere. So countries such as Greece, even Italy, uh, that were in danger of gliding into the Soviet sphere, uh, were instead attracted and persuaded um, by economic carrots to bind themselves to this American-led uh, order, liberal world order. Uh, so also the U.S. has very much used these economics, economic means to further its own political and strategic objectives. The Bretton Woods, the Washington Consensus, uh, can be thought of binding strategies as well. And today, of course, we see China excelling in this sort of geoeconomic binding. So, for instance, through its Belt and Road Initiative, China is investing hundreds of billions in binding, uh, the in, in building, sorry, the infrastructure that will link other countries um, and regions to China. And, of course, this project also brings a lot of economic benefits to these countries in Central Asia, Latin America and Africa. Um, but at the same time, it also makes them much more dependent on China, whereby China starts to get political leverage over them, and political loyalty starts to build up toward uh, China. And we see this clearly in international forums and international organizations. The, the, those, those countries that have gone into to heavy inter economic cooperation with China, they start to um, support China in, in certain important matters. Um, so China is clearly building up political relationship through these economic projects. And the danger with this sort of hub-and-spoke uh, spoke system is, of course, that these other states will, try, will, will, will start to lose some of their strategic autonomy. Um, so it's been quite a smart strategy, actually, because for a long time it didn't lead to any sort of counter-reactions um, or, or, or sort of concern about China's motives that the more direct geopolitical means certainly would, would have. Um, that there are actually highly geostrategic motives behind these seemingly economic projects have at, have, have at least until lately gone kind of under the radar very much. And China has been able to claim that it's more, mostly about business uh, and that everybody profits from it. And China has actually very smartly uh, been including many foreign economic interlocutors in these projects who have then started to to lobby for these projects as well, to some extent. So it's really a quite clever, smart, subtle, uh, and sometimes even masked strategic operation, whereby state uses, states use economic means to bind and, and build political alliances. Um, the third form of geoeconomic strategy I have named wedging. Um, so here the idea is to use economic means to drive um, a wedge through adversary alliances or, or within countries. So using econ economic means to sow the seeds of kind of disunity, discord, disintegration. Um, and this discord that the unity of the, of, the, of the other, the target state or alliance start to crack, will of course make it more difficult for that country or alliance to counterbalance, to take count, come up with an eff effective counter strategy. Um, so for instance, Russia has quite effectively been using its energy resources for, as a basis for this sort of wedge strategy in order to divide and weaken the EU to some extent. 
Some EU countries are given economic carrots, others are given the economic sticks, and then they will have diverging interests in, in, in relation to Russia. Um, those that benefit from it will support a, a kind of a more moderate line in, in, with, with Russia, and those that not, not benefit it will support a harder line, and the unity starts to crack within the EU concerning, concerning how to deal with, with Russia. Um, the Nord Stream might be an example of this sort of wedging strategy, but I'll leave that up for the discussion. Um, lastly, we have what I call hedging, um, which unlike the previous ones, is a defensive strategy. Uh, so the idea here is to protect oneself from geoeconomic power politics, from coercion, from binding, from wedging. So a defensive strategy just kind of revolves around strengthening our um, resilience and our ability to withstand these geoeconomic power politics and withstand these geoeconomic offensives um, by external actors. So one important means here would be to strengthen our supply security. Um, see to it that we're not too uh, dependent, for instance, on only one form of, of uh, energy imports or one supplier of energy or finance, um, source of finance, who can then use that strategic asset to sort of play us, even blackmail, blackmail us. So by hedging, we try to make um, sure that we're connected to a range of different economic networks, uh, different financial flows, different energy flows, uh, which then ensures that we do not become so vulnerable to geoeconomic power politics. So we're hedging our bets um, so that we can withstand geoeconomic power politics better of the sort that I've been talking about. Um, and indeed, we're starting to see more and more hedging uh, taking place in today's world, which of course raises um, some questions about the future of globalization and the liberal inter international order as such. Because when everybody starts to hedge uh, and decouple from the global value chains, uh, when they start to pay increased attention to self-sufficiency um, and to build these alternative value chains and economic networks so as not to be so exposed to geoeconomic power politics, well, then globalization starts to unravel. Um, and the current economic ties and uh, connectivities that have made up this liberal international order, it will start to unravel. So the big question now is really, um, is where this geoeconomic chain reaction will lead. Uh, and I hope we will be able to, we will discuss this more here to, to, today. Um, and certainly this is what, what we talk about in this, in this publication that we gave up, that we published uh, today with, uh, with Henrique Choer Moraes. Um, and where we try to zoom in on the way uh, geoeconomics is kind of refashioning global, the global economy uh, and the very logic underpinning it. So we claim that as a consequence of this geoeconomic chain reaction, we're moving towards uh, what we call strategic capitalism in the global economy. And we talk about what, what this really means for global economic uh, relations, including uh, companies and their strategic uh, decision making. This paper can, of course, be downloaded from our FIA website if anybody's interest, interested in it. It's really kind of a, tries to be a kind of a discussion opener. Um, so we, we welcome very much any reactions to it. And with that, I want to uh, conclude my, my uh, presentation here and, and give the floor to our, our guest speakers, um, who for obvious reasons are, are taking part in this event through the, through the web. So uh, thanks on my part. Thank you, Mikael, on, on, on a very stimulating speech. Of course, I'm, I'm very much into the, this uh, discussion myself, so, so it's uh, easy to stimulate me, but, but I was thinking about kind of pointing out the relevance of geoeconomics uh, to, to other researchers who are focusing on major changes in, in the global scene, for example decoupling, you already mentioned, uh, kind of a structural change of the global economy, uh, then, uh, then uh, uh, technologies, uh, very important new technologies and new domains are being created 
uh, 5G is going to be followed by 6G and so on. Um, and that those artificial domains are going to be geographically significant. Geography is fluid and it's changing in front of our eyes. But uh, the third, well, my question has to do with the third global structural change, and that is climate change and different policies, uh, Green New Deals uh, put forth by, uh, by US and uh, by, by European Union, different actors in US are proposing those, although the Trump administration is not very favorable towards those. But in European Union, there's quite a lot of funding in these innovation technologies. Are those geoeconomic technologies? Because, for example, electrification in Europe would mean that the dependency on the uh, natural uh, hydrocarbon of, of, uh, supplied by Russia is going to decline dramatically. And belonging to the European electric grid, super grid, then becomes kind of a unifying, integrating or geoeconomic tool that can be used. How would you see this climate change to geoeconomic bridge? Well, it can, of course, be part of it. If we think of an example of putting uh, import controls on, cer on certain imports because of, uh, of, of climate change reasons and right? green reasons, right? Which has been discussed quite a lot, on, a lot now also in this uh, European Green Deal that's floated this, this possibility of setting down some import controls. Um, this gives the possibility to strategically kind of manage such import controls, whether they then for protectionist reasons or for real reasons what that has to do with climate change. It's a fluid area where you, where you see, I think, a lot of the geoeconomic measures and this sort of what we call strategic capitalist measures that are taken today, investment screening measures, export controls, import controls, um, this sort of uh, technology sovereignty and all, all that has to do with that. I mean, they can be used for wrong reasons in, in a way as well. So then you bring in this climate change logic here and uh, on top of this, I mean, so you can start to use, use that sort of rhetoric, uh, the green rhetoric for very different purposes, right? Well, thank you for, for that. And next uh, we are going to turn to our outside speakers who are going to join us uh, through, through uh, uh, global uh, networks of connectedness, and I hope that Thomas Wright can hear us uh, here in Helsinki. Uh, Thomas Wright uh, is the director of the Center on, on the United States and Europe and a senior fellow in the project on international order and strategy at Brookings Institution. He is also a contributing writer to the Atlantic and non-resident fellow at the Lowy Institute for International Policy. Dr. Wright works on a great power competition, Brexit, and the future of the European Union, economic interdependence, Donald Trump's worldview, that's quite a task, and uh, US foreign policy. Dr. Wright has a doctorate from Georgetown University, and he's co-authoring a book on international response to COVID-19 that is going to be published uh, 2000. 21, so very, very close by. So, uh, Dr. Wright, uh, perhaps uh, if you can hear us, uh, you, you can proceed with your presentation. Great, thank you so much, and it's wonderful to be a part of this forum uh, virtually. I, I think when you originally had scheduled it, I was meant to be with you in the spring, and I'm, I'm very sorry not to be there, but I definitely hope uh, to be able to join on future occasions. Um, so thank you for, for inviting me and I very much look forward to being a part of this conversation. And thank you also to Mikhail for that terrific presentation and, and for the paper as well. And I learned a lot and I very much like um, the notion of strategic capitalism and I hope it helps to shape and define the debate in the coming years. I think this is an incredibly important uh, topic. Um, and so uh, what I wanted to do was just to make a few points in the sort of 15, 20 minutes I have uh, about the backdrop to it, I think, the role of COVID and maybe where we go um, from here. Uh, 
to me, interdependent rivalry, interdependent competition is sort of the defining feature of our world now and the, the relations between the US and China and also between uh, the West as a whole and democracies as a whole um, and uh, uh, democracies as a whole and authoritarian um, states. Um, but there is sort of a, a pre-existing uh, a condition, I think, um, that allows uh, that sort of geopolitical dynamic uh, to take hold. And that's the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2000, 2008 and 2009, because that, I think, really for the public and for workers and, and just people experiencing the global economy around the world, uh, reminded uh, reminded uh, us um, that actually globalization is not a one-way bet, um, that actually it's a two-way bet and it can destabilize our economies. Uh, it can also result in massive uh, inequalities. Uh, rising tide does not necessarily lift all boats. And so I think from 2009 uh, onward, uh, there was really a public constituency um, for deglobalization. Right. There was a public constituency to question sort of the basic assumptions of unfettered economic integration that defined the world in the 1990s and 2000s. And so when you get to the increasing geopolitical rivalry of the of the 2010s for over the last decade, um, it's more fertile ground, I think, for those making the case for decoupling than would have been the case if the financial crisis had never occurred. So I think it's important um, sort of not to forget that part. Uh, you know, Donald Trump, when he argues um, for decoupling or when you see other politicians uh, argue against China, they're doing so perhaps for geopolitical reasons. But I think the reason it resonates or maybe political reasons in Trump's case, but I think the reason it resonates is because of that broader uh, context dating back um, to the financial crisis. In terms of the geopolitical rivalry, I think Mikhail outlined it um, very well. I would just add a couple of things. Um, so one element is I think that both sides have realized over the last 10 years um, that they represent different systems, each of which inherently threatens the other, not just because of the decisions they make, but basically because of who they are, right? So from China's point of view, the system that we have here, we think of as fairly benign, right? It's a liberal open system uh, that, you know, that, that is able to incorporate China and others into it. China became quite wealthy because of that system. So it has benefited from it. But from Beijing's perspective, from the CCC's perspective, that openness comes at great risk, right? The uh, freedom of the media, for instance, allows the media to report on stories that are destabilizing uh, to the Chinese regime. The corruption stories that we saw, I think in 2012, about Bo Xilai, more recently on Xinjiang. Um, social media uh, potentially allows dissent to occur um, within China that the government can't control. Uh, companies and, and the role of investment in China also has liberalizing uh, uh, effects, secondary uh, liberalizing effects. So from Xi Jinping's perspective, that's something he has to protect against. And that's not really relating to the type of decisions that the president makes. It's just the nature of our system, right? And from our perspective, the internal repression in China, the use of facial recognition software, the desire not to have any criticism um, of the regime, all of that has negative externalities. And then their state capitalist or strategic capitalist system, which frankly they've been pursuing for many years now, is not a recent phenomenon. Uh, has serious negative externalities for our distrust um, meant once the rivalry really took hold and um, that we were going to see some questioning of this integrated system because again for 20 years or so integration just occurred if there was an economic um, benefit. Um, from our point of view I think the primary concerns uh, we're on technology, as everyone knows, ZTE, Huawei, the future of those communications um, networks, and also coercion of smaller um, countries, of allies uh, in the region, increasingly in Europe, 
um, uh, in, so in Asia, but also in Europe, and where China would use those asymmetrical advantage, uh, advantages uh, for strategic um, ends. From China's point of view, I think they worry very much about their dependency on a financial system basically controlled by the United States and the European Union, and they also worry about the information flows. Um, what was interesting to me, I think, over the last few years was the way in which the decoupling conversation evolved. Four years ago, this was dismissed, even two years ago, as just a bad idea that wouldn't work. Now, I think we're debating the size of it, like how much decoupling will occur, how limited should it be? So the conversation is quite different. And that brings me on to COVID, which I think is, um, as many people have said, a real accelerator um, of these trends, right? Because I think what COVID um, did was basically remind countries had an interest in being more autonomous and being more resilient. Now in Europe, I think you use different words, right? It's more resilience, diversification. The US, maybe it's a little bit more on um, decoupling and, and China sort of focused. Um, but it sort of adds up to the same thing. And I would add that in China, there's also been a similar discourse. There's a fascinating paper by Julian Geritz uh, of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, which basically go, you can get online, which goes into great detail. The evolution of Xi Jinping's rhetoric and interdependence, how he expanded the definition of national security uh, to include and that China has been pursuing uh, a more uh, strategy of decoupling unilaterally uh, over the last sort of five or six years. And I would add that in Europe, I think the European Union has experienced this directly because of the way in which the Made in China 2025 uh, initiative has really impaired the diplomacy that Europe has tried to pursue with China to get it to reform economically. So if you look at the evolution of the European position on China, really it changes in 2015 with the launch of this initiative and the realization that reform is not really going to happen, right? And that China is actually making a real strategic effort to dominate the technology space, to subsidize those companies uh, like Huawei and suppose we, lo we lost the connection. Uh, you know, the hybrid events have uh, entertaining sides as well. Certain drawbacks. <laughs> Certain drawbacks. But it is really good to, to hear also physical speakers uh, for a while. Uh, it has been four months since I heard so, somebody physically speaking. So, uh, Thomas, if you are there, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I got a message on my screen saying someone kicked me out of the meeting. So I hope it wasn't anything I said. <laughs> okay. um, no, I'm sorry. I'll I'll, um, I'll continue. Um, just one of the one of the, the the pearls of the of the virtual world, I guess. Um, so I, I was just saying that the 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 uh, Xi Jinping's thought in China, described in this paper, I think is quite significant. Uh, I think we've seen this dawning realization in Europe about the need for resiliency in a number of areas to do a critical medical supplies and PPE, um, but also I think. Uh, because of this shift on position on China, there's a worry about exposure on the tech side and other areas. Emmanuel Macron has been very outspoken, I think, on the need for uh, a, a more strategic and sovereign Europe. Um, and in the United States, it's sort of quite interesting, right? So in both parties, uh, you see people advocating for industrial policy. Uh, you might expect that from Democrats. Um, what's interesting is it's actually coming from Republicans too. So Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri, Tom Cotton um, of Arkansas, even Marco Rubio of Florida, all of them are arguing that the government has a bigger role to play in the national economy uh, uh, in critical sort of technology areas. Um, and the reason they argue that is because of China, right? And so I think that we are seeing a real um, shift inside these countries and ideologically and uh, maybe just slightly discombinating uh, because it sort of shifts what those old orthodoxies were. I also think the COVID crisis sort of reminds us in another way that the, our prior assumptions 
of cooperation and integration uh, maybe didn't quite turn out as uh, we hoped, right? So if you look at one non-economic example, um, and uh, you, you mentioned sort of the book I'm working on at the moment, so this is just uh, in my mind, I guess, because of that, but in 2003 with the SARS epidemic, uh, China responded in a way that was, uh, that was quite repressive, was not transparent, uh, you know, really, I think, did some damage at the time uh, in terms of handling of that pandemic. Afterwards, there was a lessons learned uh, process. They instituted reforms. Uh, Europe and the United States worked very closely with Chinese labs and scientists to try to improve their systems. There was a lot of cooperation. It worked quite well in H1M1. And we saw a lot of network cooperation throughout the 2010s. It was a centerpiece of Chinese planning on pandemics. And then in 2020, or 2020, or December 2019, it all melted away. None of those reforms mattered and they reverted back to what they did basically in SARS, right? So the, the, in terms of the model that they pursued. And the reason that that is important is because it raises, I think, basic questions about, well, uh, did those cooperation efforts which seem to succeed, why did they fail, right? Was that simply uh, a mistake, right? Or if we were to try to cooperate again, on pandemics, as most people, including myself, think we should, how do we do that differently, right? And so I think the combination of the economic issues with the pandemic and the security cooperation is initiating a fundamental rethink of the levels of sort of engagement um, with uh, between the United States and Europe on the one hand um, and China. And then finally, just on this element, and I wanna move in a minute just to where we go from here, I think there's also it, particularly with Trump's America, a European American dynamic, and uh, Mikhail mentioned this as well, but Europeans are very worried about the extraterritoriality of US sanctions, right, and of American pressure. And I think that's sort of what's driving Macron too, is it's not just that he's worried about China, he's also worried about the United States, right? And there is, um, you can't really hedge in a world of giants, if you're small, right? You have to basically coalesce with other countries. And as one European diplomat described it to me recently, he said, we don't think it's practical to retreat behind our borders, but maybe it's possible to retreat behind European borders, right? So maybe Europe as a whole can sort of retreat from the world as it were. Um, so I think that that dynamic will happen too. And particularly, I don't think Trump will be reelected, but if he is, I think that will be very much accelerated. And so I think we are looking at the emergence of blocks and that will fundamentally change globalization, right? Globalization won't completely go away, but we are in an era, I think, of deglobalization. And that is driven primarily by the geoeconomics, but there is uh, geopolitics, but there is this also this sort of resistance to the financial crisis or uh, still lingering response to the financial crisis that you see particularly uh, on the left could, that could impact financial capital flows. So the two other points I wanted to make uh, briefly just before finishing up are number one, just on climate change, which you raised a moment ago, and I think it's very important to sort of talk about in this context. Climate change could reinforce these trends because of the attractiveness or incentives towards localization, right? And so uh, 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 to reduce carbon emissions, to come up with a more a Green New Deal, that tends to be more nationally based or in Europe more, more European based, right? It, it tends not to be uh, it, it, compatible with that globalized integration that we saw for 20 years. So I think that that could reinforce uh, these deglobalizing trends by encouraging a more green friendly, more localized um, industry. And then finally, just where we go from here and what this means for cooperation, um, one of the things I've been sort of reflecting on for a while is, does this necessarily need to be contentious, right? If we acknowledge that China and the US and Europe have genuine concerns about interdependence and that each, particularly the US and China will go about this unilaterally, perhaps uh, they could talk together about ways in which to coordinate a strategic um, a, a strategic decoupling that will be limited and targeted to try to reassure uh, each other. And the parallel I would use here is that in the Cold War, 
it took us about 15, 20 years to come up with the conditions and assumptions and theories for arms control and deterrence, right? It, it, if you think about it as a concept like second strike survivability, that was quite a, uh, quite a counterintuitive concept. Um, I think we need to do the same kind of thing in geoeconomics. We basically have to invent new concepts that will allow for strategic stability between the major powers. And one of those I think may be strategic autonomy, that we are safer and more secure if we're a little bit less linked in with each other with rivals, right? So I think Europe and the US should be pretty closely linked uh, because we're allies, but in terms of uh, Russia or China or others, maybe both sides would actually be a little bit more secure if China had its own financial payment system, wasn't dependent on SWIFT, and if the US wasn't dependent on Huawei, um, perhaps that would, that would mean we'd have less volatility in the relationship. That will be very difficult to do, I think, in a negotiated basis. It could take 10 years if it's possible at all. Um, but I would like to see the next administration actually have a frank strategic discussion with Beijing to to have a more stable relationship by changing the fundamental nature of our engagement uh, in a way that will be mutually beneficial. So I'll, I'll stop there and I, I very much look forward to the conversation. Thank you. All right. uh, Thomas, thank you very much on, on those comments. And I especially appreciate it that you mentioned also small states uh, in this world of uh, geoeconomic uh, competition that seems to favor larger players. And uh, that, that was something important uh, uh, for us here in Helsinki to understand, kind of share economic value of, of European Union. And that is something that I think Finns have always uh, understood quite well. One question that I had in my mind uh, had to do with uh, illiberal innovations and uh, uh, COVID-19. There seems to have been a, kind of a leaping ahead in China when it comes to different technologies of social control. There was some hope in March or February in, 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 in the rest of the world that actually COVID-19 would result in delegitimizing the Chinese uh, political system. But the opposite happened. Uh, actually, the um, Chinese political system and the one-party rule gained quite a lot of uh, legitimacy out of uh, uh, domestically out of dealing very effectively, as they say, with the disease. So how do you see that, the illiberal innovation and, and uh, using technologies to, to squeeze the political spaces and also perhaps uh, that extending into democracies, uh, using uh, those methods and, and tools also in democracies to squeeze the political liberties here in the West as well? Uh, thanks. That's a, that's a really important question. Um, so I, I think that what COVID did was it legitimized the Chinese regime in China. Um, it, it, it strengthened its legitimacy in China um, and potentially in other autocracies. But I think it delegitimized it, you know, in Europe and in the United States and elsewhere. And I think we've seen, you know, a real shift in public opinion um, because of Chinese behavior, right? So they have responded in a way that seems more effective in terms of suppressing the virus, but the way in which they did that, the lack of transparency and also its assertiveness, I think has done great damage. But I think the point you make on liberal, illiberal innovation is incredibly important. You know, here, this controversy over TikTok, uh, this is really the first time that China has invented something that American teenagers want to use, right? So I don't think that's ever really happened before. Right, we're used to those innovations that you know that the, the that people and teenagers and others want to use coming from Silicon Valley, maybe coming from Europe. Um, this I think is a sign of the future. Right, we're likely to see more of these soft power innovations, and we'll also see them in the hard power space. Um, there's quite an interesting book by Kai Fu Li, a Chinese AI specialist that many of you may have read um, on Chinese artificial intelligence. But one of the points he makes is that China actually has many advantages, inbuilt advantages in technologies like AI in a way that it wouldn't in normal technological innovation that tends to reward open systems, right? Because AI doesn't necessarily reward open research systems 
It rewards those who have control of data, have no privacy laws and the like. And so I think one big question is, with the technologies of the future, how many of them basically play to the authoritarian strength rather than to democratic uh, ones? So that's something I think we need to be concerned about. All right, uh, Thomas, thank you very much on, on those uh, comments. And let's turn to you uh, uh, when we, uh, we wrap up these uh, keynotes and, and turn to, to panel discussion. But the next speaker uh, is very valuable to us, uh, coming from a different angle a bit, to, uh, approaching a, this topic from a perhaps more practice side of, of the equation. Victor uh, de Prado, director of the Council and Trade Negotiations Committee at the World Trade Organization, where he is especially focused on preparations for ministerial conferences and oversees the work of the General Council and the Dispute Settlement Party. He has a long career in, in uh, these uh, circles uh, uh, and also in the Brazilian uh, foreign, foreign uh, uh, ministry. He holds a law degree from the University of Sao Paulo and master's degree in international relations from a Brazilian diplomatic academy. So, uh, Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, um, and I'm very honored to be here, humbled by the uh, high level of uh, presence uh, in, this, um, in this event. I'm really, really happy to uh, participate and, and share some, some thoughts. Uh, let, me, let me start by, I was struck by what uh, Mikhail said, that geopolitics is too important to uh, left to be left to um, economists um, i would claim uh, equally that geopolitics and and, and geoeconomics is much too important to be left to politicians only uh, this is an this is an interdependent um, uh, world that we're living in and um, having brains from all sides is uh, i think very very important what I would like to do is from the perspective here of Geneva and from my, my own perspective, um, um, think about what we are seeing and what we're living and, and you will not be surprised. There is a lot of what you said, uh, Mikhail, and uh, what Professor Wright has said um, uh, that um, with which I, I, I fully coincide. Um, to start with uh, the fact that we are in a moment when history seems to accelerate um, and uh, where tendencies that we have, uh, that we had noticed before COVID um, are, uh, seem to be exacerbated um, at this moment. Uh, and one of them, of course, is um, the uh, tendencies that we're seeing of companies uh, reshoring uh, productions, uh, and um, global value chains being somewhat disrupted. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but I guess the, the, the main, uh, my main proposition is that the last months uh, uh, since COVID uh, have shown to us that we cannot dissociate uh, security issues from um, trade and economics. Um, as if we had forgotten what happened uh, before World War II with the Smoot-Hawley tariffs, when the United States raises tariffs on steel, uh, and then the UK and Canada did the same, and what happened in Germany, um, and you know the rest of the story in the 1930s, um, or the fact that um, you know, the United States used the GATT, uh, the predecessor of the WTO, basically as a framework to make concessions to its allies in a moment of Cold War. Uh, it seemed that we have forgotten, we had forgotten how uh, very closely interconnected security and trade issues are. Um, and, and, um, and we now uh, are reminded of that in a, in a, very, um, in a very dramatic uh, manner. Um, I read uh, your article, Mikael, with uh, Enrique Moraes on the emergency of uh, strategic capitalism. Congratulations for that article. Um, and but you say you the title of the of the article is emergence, uh, but somewhere 
in the middle of the article, you say re-emergence. And I think you're right. This is re-emergence of uh, strategic capitalism. Um, it's a phenomenon that we have seen in the past, but of course um, it has different actors and, um, and, and different tones uh, these days. Um, in terms of um, what, what is happening around the world, we, we just opened the papers and the feeling that we have is that we are all hostages of the US-China relationship. If you don't live in the US or in China, um, you, can, you still cannot get away from this bilateral relationship. Um, it's there and somehow it permeates um, everything that we, that we are doing uh, these days. This is clearly a more tense, a more fragmented world uh, than um, a few years back. Um, it seems like the strong countries are going to get stronger, the weak are going to get weaker, um, and those in the middle um, try to remain below the radar and avoid having to take sides. I often talk to my friends um, in Singapore, um, and of course, they don't find themselves in a very comfortable position, um, often having to choose between are you on my side or on the other side. Uh, so keeping quiet seems to be a, a strategy at this moment, not, not always possible. And of course, people are feeling vulnerable, um, and this is fertile ground for all types of political appropriation. Um, uh, Professor Wright was talking about decoupling and, and, how, uh, and how our vision of decoupling has changed, uh, and, and I cannot but agree. Um, the difference, of course, is that we thought about decoupling more on economic terms. I am struck personally by the decoupling in technology, and I think if we spoke about arms race during the Cold War, this, what we're living today, is a technology race. Um, uh, and much as this technology race is different than, than the arms race, it does use some uh, strange vocabulary that, um, that reminds us of, um, of the Cold War. Mind you, there's also a vaccine race these days. And again, to prove the point of, uh, of um, Cold War technology, the Russian vaccine is called Sputnik, right? So uh, tells, you, tells you something about the way people, people think. Um, clearly, tensions are rising, the rhetoric is rising, uh, the polarization is there, and um, the, the race for artificial intelligence clearly is going to be something that we will be, it's going to be haunting us uh, nonstop. In terms of international trade, uh, clearly, and this has been said already, um, countries are resorting to, the EU calls it strategic autonomy, autosufficiency, and of course, this became dramatic with the shortage of medical supplies, uh, reshoring that I have mentioned, global value chains uh, disrupted. So clearly, um, governments uh, are having a heavier hand in economics than they had uh, in the past. Um, the question is whether this is a structural change or this is a conjunctural change of, of COVID. Um, and I guess the jury is very much out. I am uh, very impressed by you know, the subsidies that are being granted. I'm not judging the subsidies, the helicopter money that governments are throwing, those who have money, right? Because not all governments have money to throw through, uh, through the helicopter. Um, those who have a lot of money, uh, showering money on, on, on their companies, is this going to last? Um, and what distortions this is going to create uh, in world trade and in world economics. Um, um, and I, I guess we, it's too early to say, um, but clearly on top of the subsidies and uh, issues, we, we have seen in the last years a resurgence of protectionism, um, tariffs, tariffs becoming fashionable again. You all know this, there is a certain Mr. Tariff Man um, and there's um, not only tariffs and protectionism, there's something that uh, my former boss, Pascal Lamy, calls precautionism. So, um, and very much in vogue here in Europe, um, instead of protecting the, um, the companies, 
governments are trying to protect uh, the consumers with all types of sanitary, phytosanitary measures. This call for people to uh, consume locally. Um, so um, Professor Wright was saying maybe this is something that uh, we're going to see in the future that um, you know concerns with the environment are going to make people uh, consume um, products that are produced more locally. I would just caution that pro pro um, consuming products that are produced locally is not necessarily more environmentally friendly. Um, you know, producing tomatoes in the Swiss Alps is not really environmentally friendly. It might be closer, but it's but it's not more environmentally friendly. Um, for you, gentlemen and ladies who are in in Finland. I wonder how much of your food is produced in Finland uh, itself. Uh, and if you were to produce in Finland, in the Finnish territory, all the food that is consumed in Finland, which is not a large population, you might be able to do it. I wonder what the carbon footprint would be um, in comparison to importing uh, fresh fruits, for example, from, from other countries. So. We have to get out a little bit, in my view, uh, from this sort of statements that seem to be blunt and all encompassing that um, consuming locally is, is the best. Mind you, um, I don't know how many countries can produce something like this. Is this produced locally? Well, surely not here around Geneva. If I say I have to stop buying anything that is not produced in Geneva area, I wouldn't be able to talk to you today. So um, yes, things are changing, uh, but we have to be, we have to be careful with uh, the analysis of some reshoring, some differences in um, global value chains. Probably companies will be moving to regional value chains and not global value chains. Uh, but they surely are not going to be 30 kilometers from uh, where each one of us uh, are located. Um, in all of this, of course, um, the big winner of uh, the uh, COVID uh, moment, uh, the big winner of these last months, uh, and this is going to stay, is the digital uh, sector. This is going to be there for, uh, for a long time. Um, uh, and I think we have to pay attention to how is the world going to regulate uh, the digital uh, economy. Um, we are having an e-commerce um, negotiation here in the WTO. How is that going to uh, unfold is a big question mark. Um, coming to the WTO for a moment, um, we are, uh, of course, in a bit of a, in a, bit of a uh, crisis here because uh, multilateralism doesn't seem to be a very appealing uh, concept these days. And yet, um, it's ironic, We're in a moment when the world would need to cooperate the most, it seems like people are closing up in their own uh, borders. Um, we are uh, witnessing discussions on tricky issues like market conditions, I mean, going back to um, strategic capitalism. Um, I heard somebody say the other day, we all thought that with China joining the WTO, China was going to become a real capitalist Western country. Well, it seems like the trend is the other way around. All capitalist countries are becoming state capitalist countries. So we are all adapting to China and not the other way around. It's a bit of exaggeration there. But clearly, um, the fact that states are having a heavier hand on uh, market conditions is, um, is something to be uh, reckoned with. Um, I guess my, my final uh, message is that there is no way uh, to have uh, peace and understanding and cooperation uh, without dialogue. Um, I am um, sometimes shocked by the level of rhetoric and the polarization that we're seeing uh, even in places uh, where diplomats should be talking the level of um, 
uh, of, of rage in the rhetoric is, is somewhat disheartening. Um, and I think we do need to think about exercising a bit of uh, moderation, exercising a bit more of dialogue if we are to solve uh, the problems that no matter where in the world you're living, you are facing today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor, on those comments. And one thing that I was wondering when I was listening to your uh, well thought out uh, remarks had to do with the state itself and the Western state. Uh, uh, are they unitary actors in the sense that perhaps China is or Russia is becoming? Uh, are they sovereign states in a, in a sense that, that, uh, that perhaps some uh, autocratic states are? And what is happening now in, in the West uh, perhaps is that the unified state is emerging. You mentioned the helicopter money and the, the actions of the central banks uh, recently, kind of the politicization of central bank. Uh, policies, uh, both in U.S. and, and also in, 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 in Europe. How, how would you comment on, on that, that, uh, that central banks are kind of losing their traditional mythological, I suppose, independence? Well, listen, I guess it's the fashion of the day, right? Um, we are clearly living in a world um, that is um, a Westphalian world, where the nation state is the one um, powerful actor of, um, of international relations. The example that we have seen of more cooperation, including in the financial sector, is the European Union, where because of the particular history, because of war in the European Union, in, in Europe, you have created this uh, strange animal that is the European Union, where you tend to try to coordinate all aspects of um, of uh, life, including, including finance. Uh, mind you, the problem is that you have not been able, even in the European Union, to coordinate fiscal policies, right? Uh, the, the fiscal policies are very much uh, the realm of, of each member state. Um, and clearly, uh, governments faced with threats will resort to whatever they think is, um, is most appropriate for them. So um, independence of uh, uh, central banks, which is like one of these um, mantras that we had, uh, in times of crisis, in times of threat, um, that, you know, I, I think some governments feel absolutely legitimized to throw those things out of the window. Um, and again, it has to do with security. It has to do with all of these issues that we're talking about. And, and interestingly, it seems like you know, the taxpayer and, and people who vote uh, also legitimize the actions of, um, of strong governments these days. Um, so the thinking about how much of your sovereignty are you willing to give away for the common good remains a key, um, a key question, not only in, in Europe, but, uh, but around the world. Right. Thank you very much. And I would like to remind our, our listeners and viewers through YouTube channel that, that you can comment and, and through chat, you can also post questions and, and questions, uh, comments and questions to our, our panelists. So use that and I, I can see that that uh, the about 100 uh, view viewers that we have, they have already asked quite a lot of, of questions. So you will have an exciting uh, panel discussion later on. But now let's turn to our last speaker, one of the uh, high caliber speakers that we have today that I have been uh, waiting most of, uh, Karla Norlov, who is our visiting research professor. Uh, so unfortunately, the corona pandemic happened, uh, uh, and I hope that we will have uh, collaborations also beyond your exchange stay in Finland, because it has been a little bit lonelier than, than, uh, than uh, we, we, we first thought of, but uh, there are some plans, so, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from, from you on, on, on these 
geoeconomic issues you have been working and publishing on a very high level uh, journals very productively recently on, on these issues. Uh, but as is broader than geoeconomics, it also works in sociology of, of, of science and, and works very broadly on, on different different other aspects of international relations uh, as well. So I, I highly recommend that you go and, and uh, look to, to her work. She's uh, an associate professor at uh, political science at uh, uh, University of Toronto, senior fellow of Massey College and research associate of the Graduate Institute of International Studies at Geneva, where she also stays extensively. Uh, and as, as I said, she has published quite a lot, and we are very proud to have you, Carla, at FIA. Uh, so uh, let's hear what you have to say. Well, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction, uh, Mika. I'm very pleased to be here. And so what I want to do a little bit here is to take us back to the organizing question for this event, which is you know, whether we've shifted to a geoeconomic world. And there's a great debate today on this question, and it's not an obvious, um, there's not an obvious answer to the question, because it's not really obvious what geoeconomics is. So I want to answer the question by outlining different ways of thinking of geoeconomics. And then I'm going to give you a roadmap uh, for thinking about geoeconomic power within that order. And then finally, I'm going to present a new way of understanding geoeconomic power in the area of finance. So we have the geoeconomics of Lutwak, and in the summer of 1990, he um, wrote a piece in the National Interest, and it was titled From Geopolitics to Geoeconomics. And the backdrop to this piece is, of course, that the United States has won the Cold War. And in his article, he describes a more fiercely competitive international economic environment. A high-stake economic rivalry is basically displacing military rival in this period for Lutwak. And I think that this is not the shift that we're seeing today because we have geoeconomics, but we also have amplified geopolitical competition. So the two are co coexisting. And uh, uh, the second way of thinking about this would be the geoeconomics of, of Baldwin. And David Baldwin is a political science professor at Princeton University, and his magnus opus is on economic statecraft, and uh, simply put in a book called Economic Statecraft, and it's from 1985. And it really tries to very thoroughly go through the various ways in which economic sanctions and rewards can be used for political ends. And the U.S. has been using economic sanctions as a tool and also economic rewards for a very long time in its foreign policy, but there's definitely been an uptick in the use of various ways to punitively um, reward and sanction uh, countries for strategic purposes. And so we have the trade wars, we have the tech wars, and we have financial wars. And in this Baldwinian sense, we might effectively say that we are living in a geo-economic world. And then last, we have this perspective from Blackwell and Harris. And they are both from the Council on Foreign Relations. And in their book, War by Other Means, they look at the use of economic policies, but this time really for geopolitical ends. And this third type of geoeconomics is, in my view, also relevant 
uh, today for understanding the shift to a more geoeconomic world. And here, the trade and the tech wars against China uh, can be seen as a way to blunt Ch China's economic rise. The financial sanctions against Iran, a way to prevent Iran from producing nuclear ambition and therefore establishing regional uh, hegemony in the Middle East. But so in this geoeconomic world, uh, you know, if we're assuming uh, type two geoeconomics a la Baldwin or type three, according to Blackwell and Harris, then it's interesting to think about, you know, what gives states leverage to promote these political goals. And there are three ways, basically, that one can think about this. Um, so a kind of asset-based power asymmetry would focus on capabilities, whether they are military or economic capabilities. Um, you know, this uh, form of power is actually often discounted by scholars. Um, it's seen as a form of marble counting game, which is not particularly interesting. Um, but actually, it is very important. It's foundational to how we think about power. And then we have these relational power asymmetries. Um, so the idea that really power is very context dependent and it's exercised in a particular relation. Um, and here we often think about power uh, as the ability of um, A to get B to do what B would not otherwise do. And this is a Dahlian conception of power uh, attributable to the political scientist Robert Dahl. And I would say that much of the geoeconomic analysis is actually in this vein. Um, a state basically exploits asymmetries, uh, economic interdependencies, um, and uses these asymmetries as some form of leverage to get what it wants politically. And here at uh, FIA, um, I would say that there's been real pioneering work uh, on this form of geoeconomic power uh, by Mikael Vigel and by Mika Altola, and also in the audience, Anton uh, uh, Anto, uh, Vima. And what they've done is basically to conceptualize the range of geoeconomic strategies that are available to states and differentiating these geoeconomic strategies from geopolitical strategies. And I highly encourage everybody in the audience and also everybody watching to very closely uh, read their work. And then the third form of power can be kind of divided into two different perspectives, but basically it's structurally derived power asymmetries. And the, the first form uh, goes back to the 60s, 70s, and was introduced by Susan Strange, and she introduced the concept of structural power to explain America's dominance in security, trade, finance, and also in the information and technology sector. And here, structural power is understood as the power that is derived from the ability to influence the rules of the game, the context in which states interact, which affect their strategies. Uh, and therefore, at the intersection of these strategies, it also affects the political outcomes. And then we have a second type of structurally derived power asymmetry, which one can call network power. And network theory has its origins in sociology. And network power is power that derives from a state's position within a network. Uh, but it is also derived from the structure of the network itself. In other words, the configuration of the network. And in a security studies article, uh, Bill Wolforth from Dartmouth um, College and I explain U.S. dominance in security networks by looking at U.S. network power. And as a result of the configuration of 
uh, the U.S. security network, we show that the U.S. has informational advantages and it also uh, has the ability, because of the way that it's situated and because of the way that the network is structured, to exclude and include various actors in this, um, in, in this um, security network. And there's a certain kind of path dependency here because these networks tend to be very sticky over time and there's a kind of self-licking quality to the associations within the network. So, but what I really want to do here is to show you what this network power means in the area of finance. And I've computed two graphs, and um, th this way of looking at network power in finance is different from other uh, previous uh, ways because what I'm really interested in is I'm not interested in all of the ties that um, countries have. I'm interested in the privileged ties that provide the basis for leverage, that provide the basis for geoeconomic power. And so there are certain things that we know about the U.S. in international finance. We know that it is the most significant great power, both in terms of the, um, the amount of capital that other uh, countries uh, export to the U.S. and also the amount that the U.S. exports to other countries. In other words, how much uh, ca capital is uh, held in the U.S. and also how much is uh, held abroad. And the sh share of the U.S. share of the world total is something like 30%, and the nearest competitor's share is 10%. But, I, but even looking at those world shares on both sides actually uh, grossly understates the extent of U.S. financial power, which is visible in this kind of hub-and-spoke uh, illustration of U.S. Uh, financial power. So what we have here uh, are basically, uh, it's a color-coded graph. And so the light blue is for Europe, and the dark blue is for North America, and the green is for Africa, the yellow is for South America, the orange is for Oceania, and the red is for Asia. And when you see the larger circles, that's just because they're connected to the hub. And it, we, in this particular figure, uh, you know, we're looking at where does most of the capital go? In other words, um, where are most uh, foreign assets held? And that is in the direction of the arrow. And so we see very clearly that it's mostly held in the United States, by far. And then we have a second hub and it's Luxembourg. But actually, Luxembourg then holds most of its assets in the United States. And here, what I've done is I've calculated then in this kind of network structure where most, uh, you know, where most of the um, uh, capital uh, is coming from. And also here, it's in the direction of the arrow. So wherever the arrow is pointing at, that is where the capital is coming from. And again, we see that it's coming from the United States. So the United States is, um, again, very clearly a hub. And we see other hubs here as well, again, Luxembourg and Germany and the UK and France, and to a certain extent, Saudi Arabia, right? Um, but in very stark terms, uh, these two graphs show us uh, that the US really is ex exceptionally strong uh, financially in terms of the kind of geoeconomic power that it could potentially wield in the financial setting vis-a-vis uh, -vis other countries. So the upshot here is that these network properties 
provide us with key insight to the asymmetrical structure of the system, in this case, the financial system. And we see that although, for instance, the US and the UK are often mentioned in the same breath when one sees, uh, speaks of financial centers, um, there is, there's clearly a very large difference between um, the geoeconomic power that the US and the UK have um, in terms of how dependent other countries are on them within the financial system and therefore actually their potential to exercise geoeconomic power. And what we also see from this collection of graphs is the rather marginal role played by other great powers. So when we shift our lens from a geopolitical lens to a geoeconomic lens, really the US emerges as much more powerful than uh, what is usually thought. And we get this because of these um, asymmetrical economic ties, but also because we are looking at this from a network perspective and we're not just looking at this in terms of the underlying capabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carla, on, on, on those comments. Uh, I love these graphs and, and uh, maps that actually show power from a different angle than, than we are used to seeing uh, power. And, and those are power, you know, the power that has to do with financial flows mm -hmm. and how money flows uh, in, in different uh, corners of the world and how that is very centralized, allowing US to weaponize, for example, uh, the flows of a dollar uh, and use sanctions because most of the money uh, at some point goes through the US market, so it is okay. visible there. Uh, so you can tap into that and, 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 and do stuff to it. So it is a very concrete way in which US can, can use that. But I was wondering, uh, because of uh, one other map that, that I have been always very fascinated about has to do with data flows and the kind of the cyber infrastructure and the cables. And those maps are very close to these maps of, of uh, financial flows. Uh, that there's a correspondence between kind of the technology underlying uh, infrastructure of data and then the new kind of digitalized financial flows. That, that should, that duality, then with the hardness of the technology, the cables be looked uh, upon from the angle of geoeconomics uh, as well. Um, yes, I think that would be very interesting to do. I suppose that there would be a slight problem in accessing that kind of data. So it would be difficult to gain insight into what the in exact interdependencies are. Mm. Yeah. And the practice is mm. like a fast frequency trading that has to do with the cables mm -hmm. and the connections and the speed of, of data mm -hmm. and how that is used to, to kind of a, uh, create money and, and, and uh, influence these financial flows. Mm -hmm. So the practices matter as well. But uh, with that, uh, I would like to hand this over to the panelists uh, and, and the audience and, and uh, like to, uh, for the next half an hour to take comments from the physical audience here in Helsinki and, and also our close to 100 uh, viewers currently. Uh, uh, over the internet. Uh, so, um, any any particular comments that you would like to pose to our four panelists here, and also uh, yeah, through internet. So, uh, if there's none yet here, I would like to perhaps uh, ask ask uh, in behest of the panel uh, of the internet viewers. There was one comment by, by Johanna Jakobson, who actually wrote uh, uh, briefing papers to us and used to be a scholar at, at FIA a few years ago, and he was asking, uh, is this decoupling 
between China and US, is it fundamentally value-based decoupling, that there's different values that these two actors have, or is it just uh, different practices of protectionism and kind of a mercantilistic uh, protection of the markets that they, they are using? So is it value-based, or is it kind of a general universal geoeconomic policies that they are uh, using when they are decoupling? And um, I don't know who, who would like to go and, and answer this question concerning the nature of the decoupling. Let's ask Thomas or, or Victor if you wanna. Can you? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll jump in. I think it's much more than a simple um, trade and, and tariffs. Um, this is, um, let's put it bluntly, this is really a power game. Um, and it has to do with, as I said, it has to do with research, it has to do with technology, um, it has to do with um, production, with, any, with economic models, if, if you wish. Um, I'm struck when, again, I'm gonna mention Singapore. Um, I go to Singapore and I see my friends, they have, two phones they have one uh, phone in their hands where they have all of the western applications and that's the phone that they use uh, in singapore and with their western friends and then they have another phone in their other hand with all of the chinese apps um, that they use with the chinese friends i mean can you see a better uh, example, I mean, a visual example of the decoupling. I mean, the apps from one and the other do not talk to each other, and they want to make sure that they that they don't. Um, and and this is this is just a visual example. It's a simple one, but imagine this um, in the level of companies. Imagine this in the level of international regulation. Um, imagine this on the level of um, investment. So it's, it's a much broader uh, issue, uh, I'm afraid. Yeah, I would just add, I, I agree with that. Um, I think it is values-based in the sense that, you know, these two systems, I think, are increasingly incompatible with each other. I mean, I find it hard to imagine any assurances that Beijing could give the United States that would change the view here on Huawei. Right, and the reason for that is fundamentally uh, the U.S. does not trust the regime right to respect any sort of guarantees it makes because in a future crisis, um, the strong temptation will be there to use that leverage with those tech firms. And I'm sure, you know, Xi Jinping feels exactly the same in terms of China's dependence on the financial system or the role of social media or the like, right? So I think that's what sort of, I think that is the key driver. There are also then all these other elements which are important, but maybe not quite as significant. And, and those, some of those are economic, some of those are, you know, people, uh, you know, wanting, um, you know, a bit more protectionism or maybe more narrowly uh, trade base. But I think that system, or if you want to call it the values division, I think, is, is the key driver here. Okay, thank you. We have uh, three questions from the audience here, and let's take those. And I will add also one question. I think the, this directly goes to um, Dr. Vikel. Uh, what is the difference between strategic capitalism and central bank capitalism? Uh, it also relates to the discussion we had before on, on the role of central banks. But let's take uh, the question from the audience. Uh, was it only for Mac? Yes, uh, so if you post the question and state also your, your, your background institution. Uh, Oli Rohamäki, a former FIA member, now at MFA in Finland. Uh, thanks for the fascinating uh, talks by all the um, speakers. Uh, I have a particular question to Professor Carla. I was uh, fascinated with your graphs and, and particularly the last slide where China was minuscule mm. compared to all the other uh, uh, players. Um, can you open a bit on the data that you used and uh, do you see the role of China, actually that minuscule uh, points that you had 
uh, changing, becoming bigger in, in the future. All right, thank you. Let's take uh, two more questions. Uh, Berti, if you go first. Thank you. There's one question that has been puzzling me for, for a couple of years. And uh, that is that, uh, what is the role of European Union in international trade policy in the coming years? I was very much personally involved with the TTIP negotiations once when I was the Minister for Foreign Trade. And, and, uh, and, and that, uh, that, didn't, uh, that wasn't very successful, uh, unfortunately, and we know the, the reasons. So how do you see the possibility of new transatlantic uh, negotiations about trade? There is one area where the European Union is very united, and that is trade and customs policy. In many other areas, we are very diverged and not united at all. And, and I'm so sorry that the British are also leaving us, which uh, damages uh, the free traders in the European Union, unfortunately. But what, uh, how do you see the possibility of, of TTIP or something like that happening in the future? Now we almost have the feeling that America is more or less an enemy of the European Union and not as a partner in, in trade policy. So this is something that puzzles me very much indeed. Yeah, well, that's a good question concerning so-called deep trade agreements. Uh, there was another question there, so let's have that. All right, uh, thank you. So Atte Haaren, MP from the Parliament of Finland. I was interested in, in uh, the role of large businesses and enterprises uh, either state-owned, government-linked or otherwise, it seems that from a geoeconomic perspective, it's an asset if you have, are a host nation for a, for a big, large enterprise that has, like, yeah, well, uh, economic power. But then from the point of view of economics, having two dominant role of big companies and, and state control in the economy is probably bad. So there seems to be a kind of trade-off in the future or already in this. And uh, I would be interested to see, uh, of course, the European Union uh, regulatory philosophy is very much for free markets and, and liberal market uh, markets. So does this put the uh, EU uh, in, a, in a weaker position in geoeconomics ge uh, compared to the other players who have maybe a better ground for creating these very powerful uh, specific uh, large companies? All right, thank you. Uh, let's now have a round of, of uh, comments on, and reflections on this, these questions and comments. So perhaps we start from uh, Thomas, uh, from, from you. Uh, and you can pick and choose uh, what comments you would like to perhaps reflect upon. Sure. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the trade issue and then maybe the last um, question also. Um, so I think this is one area that we're likely to see pretty fundamental changes, especially if uh, Joe Biden wins the presidency in the U.S., right? So uh, the TTIP model uh, was uh, basically around tariffs and regulatory alignment in key sectors. And the official assessment from the EU was that that would result in a very small bump of GDP in Europe, and it was similar for the United States. And I think the view here um, is that that is not really enough to justify the political lift, the political capital to take um, to get it done. Um, and that, uh, that that is also fairly disconnected from the anxieties and concerns that people have about the global economy, right? Regulatory alignment, people don't really like changing their regulations on autos or farms, food or whatever. Um, and they quite like them the way they are, um, and they tend to be tough agreements to get ratified. It's very hard to imagine TTIP, I think, getting ratified if it's agreed. So the alternative, which some people are mooting here, is to have a much narrower, but also more ambitious uh, set of negotiations that would have a common European and American position on a variety of issues that go to the core of the global economy. So international taxation, how companies uh, can have to pay tax somewhere, right, rather than avoiding it um, everywhere, 
uh, the technology issues that we've already spoken about, uh, sanctions perhaps, uh, some elements of the trade uh, trading relationship, in particular how to deal with the more mercantilist China, how to negotiate collectively. Uh, I think we're likely to see a Biden administration try to launch that type of dialogue, and it would take it out in a way of the trade negotiators, right? Because it would be more pertinent to the overall state of the economy. But I'd be very curious what the reaction is uh, to that. But to me, that is a more appropriate foreign economic policy for the moment we are in than persisting um, with sort of deals about regulatory alignment between nations and, and blocks that are already pretty free trading. Okay, thank you. Uh, Victor, would you like to take on some, some of the comments? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, first, this, the same one on EU-US uh, relations um, and, and where is this going? Clearly, uh, several levels of, uh, of relations uh, there. Um, there's the, what I would call the traditional economy. Um, and the, the perception here in Europe is that the US has uh, treated them unfairly on, you know, putting tariffs on steel. Um, you know, these, Europe is the traditional ally of the US and etc. Then there are long-standing issues like subsidies to aircraft industry, um, never, never ending quarrels between two large uh, aircraft companies and, and agricultural subsidies. Um, then, of course, the tax issue for the big tech companies. And I would say adding um, all to all of that, and this is a fascinating discussion, is, the, uh, is data flows. Um, clearly, Europe took a bit of a lead with the GDPR. Um, now, the question uh, about should data flow freely um, with certain exceptions, or should... Uh, the privacy become a uh, overall concern, and if privacy is respected, then data may flow freely. These are two sides of the same coin, and the differences between the US and, um, and Europe there um, should not be underestimated. So any, um, any future agreement or regulation on, on, on data flows will depend, I would say, on a transatlantic uh, agreement to start with. Uh, so again, uh, the technology issues uh, seem to be uh, quite overriding uh, these days. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Carla, if you go next. Yeah, I will respond to the uh, question on uh, Chinese financial power. Um, because uh, China is quite marginalized in that respect, and we get the same kind of picture if we look at um, its efforts to internationalize its currency. Um, I think that could change quite quickly, depending on what China does, uh, but it is a bit of a laggard in that respect. If uh, I were to create the same mapping for trade relations, uh, China would be much more central to the system. Okay. Uh, I'll try to take up three of the questions very quickly. First of all, about the, the kind of the transatlantic trade relation and what, what's the prospect for it. I think it comes down to a very simple answer. It depends on the US presidential elections, <laughs> right? <laughs> if Trump wins, bad prospect. If Biden wins, pretty good prospect. I agree. Right? <laughs> The, the second question about uh, you know, strategic capitalism versus the other forms of capitalism what, what, that, that we talk about in the, in the paper, state capitalism on one hand, free market capitalism on the other hand. The difference really is, as I see it, and I try to summarize, is that you know, free market capitalism, the state tries to facilitate private profit-making in the you know, Fundamentally, it's about providing uh, the climate for private company, for private sector to become efficient, to, be, to, to gain economic efficiency. In state capitalism, on the other hand, so the, the, kind of, the, the private income is a, is a big motive there. In the state capitalism, you have its national income, national income, which is a big, big, big motive. So the state goes into all sorts of economic areas. 
It intervenes in a lot of different economic areas and economic transactions and, and relationships. Strategic capitalism is somewhere in between. So there, the state goes in choosing particularly strategically sensitive areas where it wants to protect. So it goes into critical infrastructure. It goes into emergent technologies. So it chooses certain very important areas that are important from the power political perspective and this power political game that goes on in the world. Their kind of strategic capital, that's the logic, the rationale between, behind uh, strategic capitalism and, and uh, the sort of, sort of uh, methods used here are, of course, think about investment screening. So it used to be the case that the Western states wanted to attract investments. They, did, they went over their way to attract investments. That's not the case anymore. We're moving into a more strategic capitalist world where you start to screen investments, choose which investment you want and which you want to not have, right? You see it quite a lot in the, in the, in the last few years. Um, this, the last question I'll just briefly about uh, kind of launch the, the, the advantage of having large enterprises. So there we kind of come to think of China, for instance, that have this big corporation, state corporation, whether that gives an advantage in a geoeconomic sense. Well, that's, that's the kind of intuitively uh, thing. We intuitively kind of tend to think that, yes, this is the case, because China can steer these big corporations and use them for geoeconomic purposes, for national strategic purposes. But let's not for, forget that, you know, what Germany does to, to some extent within the EU, it uses free market and, and, and uh, to discipline Greece or Italy, and so on and forth. That's a sort, of, and, and, and it gains certain power through that as well, that we've seen in recent years since the financial crisis. So you can very much use free markets as well in geoeconomic sense. Uh, it's just a different models how, how, you, how you kind of, kind of use it. All right, thank you. So let's have uh, one more round of uh, comments and questions. Uh, at least Anto has hand up. So go ahead, Anto. Thank you, Mika Anto Ihma from FIA. Uh, question regarding international cooperation and the future of uh, international cooperation, especially multilateral cooperation. It was noted that uh, uh, we would need that kind of cooperation to address uh, global problems more than uh, perhaps ever. However, the prospects in the geoeconomic world look very bleak. I'm not sure if this is ironic uh, situation, but it's definitely a tragic one. Um, how do you see, uh, how do you think that we will look at uh, a multilateral cooperation, let's say the WTO or the Paris Agreement, in the FIA Forum of uh, 2030 or 2040? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, next, uh, Kai Sauer, our chairman of the board. Thank you, Mika, and thank you to, to all the speakers. Um, on these kind of events, I, I like to reduce the question uh, to, to something uh, from you know, the, the general, general level to a more Finnish uh, context. Um, we are pretty well informed about uh, the main geopolitical uh, challenges of, of Finland, uh, but uh, could you uh, give your assessment and the uh, question goes perhaps to, to uh, Mikhail. What are the uh, greatest uh, geoeconomic uh, vulnerabilities of, of Finland? Thank you. And uh, that connects to one of the questions uh, in here in the chat. Uh, you know, economically speaking, we have been discussing today that, that perhaps uh, for smaller countries it makes sense to group together to larger uh, entities and, and blocks like uh, the European Union. Uh, but uh, how come uh, Brexit then happened? Uh, what was the kind of a geoeconomic reasoning if we expect that the uh, UK is a rational actor? What was the uh, reasoning behind that? And then uh, we have a question uh, here. The last one. Hi, I'm Lena Mertinen from the Ministry of Finance. I'm the Director General of the Financial Markets Department there. 
So, of course, very much an economist and very interested in how finance functions. And the one thing that we realized after the financial crisis is, of course, that finance is a very tricky thing to get right and it can be easily distorted. And the crisis, when it proves up on the financial side, can be devastating. Uh, we've been discussing the impact of COVID, but I was wondering, particularly as comes to uh, uh, Mr. Wright's point about could we sort of coordinate somehow the strategic decoupling? Now, the one thing that financial markets are very worried about and the one thing that we have been able to keep in check or has stayed in check is inflation. Now, the, the decoupling, no matter how you try to do it, it will break up the global value chains. Have you been giving a thought of what would happen with financial instability in this world? What sort of push would that cause to the system? Excellent question. So let's uh, now have a final round of, of reflections upon the audience questions and the comments and also your final remarks. Unfortunately, we are running gradually out of time. So uh, let's start from, uh, from here, from the physical side of the world. So uh, perhaps uh, who wants to go first? Uh, go Dr. Vikel. Yeah, about the, thanks for the question. I think it's, it's good to, to uh, remind ourselves about the, kind of the, the situation the small countries are in in this situation and certainly Finland. When it comes to Finland, I think Finland is very well prepared, actually, for this. Uh, first of all, we have a very strong tradition of a certain security supply thinking in Finland and crisis preparedness. We have kept a, the model of security supply from the Cold War, um, and it's, it's there in place, and we have this very kind of long tradition of economic security thinking, which is, and broad, broad security thinking, which is really important when you think in these terms of hedging, which I was speaking about, right? Uh, and we're a member of the European Union. So what, what uh, was said here before is that a small country, hedging for a small country is difficult on its own. It, you, you need to integrate in order to be able to hedge efficiently. Finland is integrated very well in, in, in Europe, so that gives us a lot of preparedness for this sort of situation. And perhaps the big risk here is actually that we, we uh, forget this, less, this that self-sufficiency or kind of resilience, uh, national preparedness, it's not something that you do on your own only. You do it together in cooperation with others, especially if you're a small country. Okay. Carla. Um, yes, so uh, Anto's uh, question is interesting about where we're going to be, um, you know, in 2030 and uh, 20, 30 years from now. I think it's a very difficult uh, question to ask, which is, again, I think, contingent uh, on the direction of U.S. domestic politics very much. Um, the return to kind of these bilateral deals is probably something that we're going to be moving gradually away from. Uh, most countries do not like it. I mean, the current U.S. president has a pension for them, but most other countries do not like to be at the other end of a negotiation between such a behemoth and um, left alone to the vagaries of, of that situation. I'd also actually like to tackle this question about financial uh, instability. Um, I think it's, it's true, of course, uh, cap capital flows are very vo volatile, and especially if we think about portfolio flows. But the, the kind of figure that I presented there is not something ephemeral, or that is a question of just the way that the world looks today. It's a rather stable picture of the relationship that the United States has had with other countries over time. When you think about the portfolio assets uh, that the United States has abroad, and that um, the, the kind of foreign uh, assets held in the United States. Um, I think that one of the more remarkable things that we see in the, in the post-COVID uh, uh, situation is the way that financial markets have held up, right? Um, there was a real spike in the, in the volatility index, the fear index, uh, in March. Uh, but since then, uh, volatility has declined, and I'm not even quite sure why it's rather low today. I mean, in the, certainly the equity markets uh, are kind of cheering, and I, it's not really clear what they're cheering, but because there's not a lot of uh, political reasons uh, to, to be, uh, feel very confident today. Central bank policies, of course, uh, but even that, there should be some kind of limit to, you know, uh, how, how much uh, money uh, can kind of reassure uh, investors that these uh, stocks will keep on going up and up and up. Yeah. Okay, uh, Thomas, perhaps you go next. 
Yeah, just two, um, two quick remarks. On the cooperation side, I think cooperation between democracies and China is incredibly important. Um, there's a number of transnational issues where we have shared interests. It's important that that not uh, be a victim of the geopolitical competition. But I also think that that cooperation will be limited, that we shouldn't expect to get too much out of it, uh, that it could be quite sort of difficult um, and that it will be affected by the geopolitical competition, even you know, if it continues. And I think the public health cooperation that we've seen over the last 15 years that I referred to earlier is a good example of that. I think uh, the example, the other example I use sometimes is the EU-China relationship because the EU, you know, it's fairly geopolitically benign toward China, right? It actually um, wants a cooperative relationship in a way that maybe the US is in a different place on it. And the EU, I think, has been terribly frustrated by Beijing over the last uh, five years, right? So that, I think, just points to the natural limits and cooperation. So. I would say we should definitely try to do it. Um, we need to find a way to do it that uh, seals it off, I think, from the elements of rivalry. I don't think we're going to be able to stop the rivalry, right? So I think we want to try to segment it um, in a way that non-proliferation was during the Cold War, arms control. Obviously, now we're talking more in the economic and transnational sphere than those hard security issues. Um, but I think we also need to be realistic. Um, that we're not likely to see a massive uptick in cooperation for a variety of reasons. Um, the other point uh, was on the, um, was, was just, I, I think, could you remind me the last question again? I wanted the, the very final question. Yes, it's coming. Oh, just even one word prompt to <laughs> remind me of what it, because yeah, I wanted to, to comment quick, on that too. So, yeah, it was about, the strategic decoupling, whether we could do that sort of uh, in cooperation, my worry is right. breaking up the global value chains, causing the inflation, which is the central bank's domain. Right. They would not be able to control it, financial crisis. How would this scenario play? How to calm that down in this world? Right, no, no, it's a very interesting point. I mean, I think, um, so look, I think that the, we've already seen companies adjust uh, particularly American companies, but I also think global companies to the US-China rivalry, particularly cognizant of the far reach of the US Congress in terms of sanctions and other restrictions. Uh, so I think we've already seen it affect investment and financial flows and decisions on where you know corporate headquarters are based. Uh, if you look at what happened in Hong Kong this year, you know that is also a major shock. Uh, I think that will affect how companies sort of distribute their operations, uh, financial companies in particular, and their operations in Asia and in, in China. Um, and I don't think we've seen massive volatility as a result of that. So I don't want to be complacent about it, I guess. And I'm sure you know a lot more about it um, than I do and the other panelists um, do too. But I'm actually a little surprised um, that it has been as orderly as it has been in terms of the markets. And I think they have a very clear signal um, as well. So they have some time um, to implement that. But I, I may very well be wrong about that, but I just think based on what we've seen so far, uh, we haven't really seen that volatility and I would have expected uh, a lot more of it at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, Victor, you give us your final word. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I don't know what the WTO and other outfits, multilateral ones, are going to be like in 2030 and, and beyond. I can tell you what I would like to see uh, um, in, a, in a more or less realistic um, scenario. What I'd like to see is cooperation uh, that leads at least to a um, coexistence between two large powers um, and not conflict uh, between them. Uh, I think a peaceful coexistence is something that is possible, um, but it does require uh, leveled uh, heads. Um, and it also requires other players coming into uh, the conversation, uh, the European Union for sure, uh, others like Japan, Australia, 
uh, India. We haven't talked about Africa at all. Uh, I think development will continue to be a big issue, has to be addressed. Question of income distribution absolutely needs to be addressed. Climate needs to be addressed. And for all of that, you would need a much more uh, proactive uh, engagement with civil society. So the one area where I would hope that the WTO and other, uh, uh, other international organizations open up is uh, with increased dialogue with, with civil society. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it has been very uh, stimulating two hours and uh, I have to say that uh, it feels good to be back in the physical way and connecting with people and actually listening in uh, not distracted by, by other things going on in, in, in one's household. So uh, I would like to thank our panelists uh, for, for their uh, contributions. And uh, I have to apologize to Thomas and Victor. We are going to be now going to a reception and, and going to hear an excellent speech by Kai Sauer, the chairman of our board. And, and you cannot join us uh, virtually to have this physically distanced uh, glass of wine with us. Um, and also thank you like very much. I hope we can, will you invite us next year physically. <laughs> we will. Yes, we will. thank we, you. We owe, owe you one. And, and, and let's hope that next year we can have a bigger event and, and meet again. So thank you very much uh, um, to our panelists and also to Mikhail and, and Carla for, for your contribution and for our audience here. Uh, at, at Music House and, and also uh, uh, over the YouTube. Uh, it has been good two hours. Let's uh, return to this topic uh, in the future. I'm, I'm sure that it resonates in different ways uh, uh, with, uh, with our uh, foreign policy and security thinking here in Finland. So thank you very much. <laughs>